Good morning once again and welcome to Nature Watch. Nature Watch is sponsored by Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center at the corner of Milliman 12th Street, right there on the roundabout. Now here's your host of Nature Watch, Gary Miller. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? Good. A little, little colder than the last few weeks, but uh, it's yeah. winter. So. Yeah. And she said, you know, the flurry activity is going to stop. Well, it is stopped for us. Um, yeah, not because too much I was watching the radar and uh, it just essentially dissipated as soon as it got close to Kalamazoo. So, so I was looking at the extended forecast and it looks like they're talking about possibly some winter storm or yes. close to winter storm Tuesday, Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And uh, not knowing exactly how those temperatures are going to swing with the jet stream. So uh, we might get some rain snow mix. So it might be a little messy out there. But the extended uh, the following week looks like it's going to get cold. Yeah. We got some highs in the teens. <laughs> and uh, I was I was noticing from about next weekend on, about every day there's a chance of snow. So I think Mother Nature and winter have decided, oh, hey, we've been messing around long enough. Long enough, yeah. It's because time. you're uh, lackadaisical now. Uh, we're going to make you sh- know that it's winter now. So <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's I, I uh, talked with Matt Kirkwood when I uh, filled in for Ken uh, a week or so ago. And he said, uh, right around the 10th, 11th of January, Winter's going to return, and we think it's going to stick around this time. So it's like, okay, oh, well, you know. No, it looks like, you know, on the, of course it's extended, so it can change you know, numerous times depending yeah. on how the jet stream Welcome shifts. Welcome to Michigan. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it uh, looks like we might get some, maybe a little bit of snow. Not a, nothing significant, though, but uh, going to be colder, it looks like, anyway. Yeah. Uh, at least it'll maybe kill off some of those pesky insects, you know, like the ticks that and would, the mosquitoes. That would mosquitoes be nice. And, the... and, you know, I'm wondering if the reason I'm not seeing a lot of birds at our bird feeders is because there are still insects flying around. Right, and it's the been birds warm enough. And are able to, uh, to munch on yeah, those. Be- between insects and we haven't had any, you know, significant snow, that we usually we get that really heavy snow, wet snow that knocks a lot of plants down. Uh-huh. That covers a lot of that stuff, uh, you know, foods that uh, birds will forage on. And they have difficulty getting them. Sometimes those lower on the ground level or so get covered by ice or so. So they come into the feeders more frequently. But it's, it's been pretty well clear out there. So they've been out foraging more than anything. So I'm guessing in the next few days, I'm probably going to see birds returning to You're my feeders. You're going to start seeing them move yeah. closer to the feeders. <laughs> okay. They, they don't want to have to work too hard because they got to keep themselves warm. This too. This is true. The, Harder they work, the more energy they expend. This uh, is true. So what uh, what do we have on the docket for today? Uh, so actually, a couple a couple of things. I um, actually wanted to talk a little bit about the quadranted uh, meteor shower again. Yeah. Um, Wednesday morning, uh, or Thursday morning, actually, was the peak, and it was so cloudy you couldn't see anything. <laughs> uh, so And the skies have been very cloudy just about every night, so not going to see much of it. If we get a clear night, though it doesn't look too promising here in the future, um, we might see a few remnants of that. It's around till about the 12th. Uh, so you might see an occasional meteor go, uh, but we missed the peak. Um, again, we had clouds, so not unusual. Uh, the uh, Kellogg Bird Sanctuary has got their first uh, second Wednesday of the month uh, birds and coffee online chat, and uh, that's 10 to 11 a.m. Um, you need to register ahead of time so you get the Zoom link. Um, so they have neat uh, topics. They usually have some uh, staff from Michigan State besides the Bird Sanctuary uh, staff that uh, host that. And... Uh, Wolf Lake Fish Hatchery, um, some of you folks that uh, may have been paying attention or have gone out there before, today they have their monthly beginner bird walk, and it starts at 9. So I hope you're on your way out there and listening to the radio on the way out. And uh, that occurs uh, every uh, first Monday of the month, uh, 9 a.m., um, led by expert birders from the Cal- Kalamazoo Audubon Society and uh, open to any level of birder, um, experienced, novice, beginner, um, all ages. Um, so uh, neat way to get uh, maybe some kids in, in, introduced to some birding in that. And uh, they uh, also have uh, coming up on the 20th, so two weeks from today, uh, a lantern lit trail. And that's Saturday evening, 6 to 8 p.m. And they're going to have a one mile loop around the fish hatchery and they're going to have lantern lit trails. Uh, they're going to have some hot cocoa and s'mores with a bonfire. So might be cold that weekend, so it looks like, in the extended forecast. So it might be a neat way to get out and uh, bundle up and then stay warm at the fish hatchery. Yes. That's cool. Well, the fish hatchery, the, the ponds and the, that they have there pretty well stay open most of the year, mm-hmm. unless it gets really cold for a while. And so they get a lot of waterfowl in there. And there's several lakes around the fish hatchery, too, that they get a lot of waterfowl. So sometimes you see some unique waterfowl that uh, you may not see elsewhere. Hmm. Um, and then... Uh, 
I have to do a little plug for uh, Waddell's Green Thumb Club series. Uh, that's starting uh, here in, in two weeks. Uh, and uh, Saturdays, uh, January, February, first part of March. We've got one or two seminars each Saturday. And I mention that because we've got a couple of them might be interested to uh, listeners out there. Uh, coming up on the 20th, uh, there's going to be a, a talk on landscaping with native plants for pollinators. Okay. Um, on the 27th, uh, there's a talk about, and actually the title of this is pretty humorous, a squirrel, a deer, and a chipmunk walk into your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so how to take care of those critters and make yes. sure they don't decimate your landscaping in that. Uh, maybe some uh, humorous talk. And then on the 10th of February, another one, a bird in the bush is worth two in the feeder. So oh. landscaping for birds. And uh, th- those uh, there's numerous other seminars on, the, uh, on those various Saturdays. Uh, $5 a seminars are pretty inexpensive, a little bit of your time. If you do six or more of them, so if you do six of them, that's $30. Okay. And your time, you're going to get a $25 gift card from Models. Oh, wow. And, and a Nice certificate that says you completed the Green Thumb Club. So, oh, very cool. So, some other neat topics out there, but I thought those particular topics might be of interest to listeners out there. Yeah. Might be so, a worthwhile activity here. This would so, be fun. You know, looking for something to do on some Saturday mornings. There Check out um, the Waddell's uh, website, waddells.com. Look at the events, and you can see uh, what seminars are out there, and you can register for those ahead of time. Yeah. So something something to do in the wintertime. Uh, you can get tired of, you know, Sitting there and watching the birds at the bird feeder, and you want to get out of the house for a little bit and interact with some other folks. Uh, neat way to do it. So. Yeah, sounds like fun. I don't. I'm not a real green thumb guy, but hey, if you want to learn? Here's your chance. Well, here's your chance to turn that brown thumb into a green, green thumb, thumb too. Thumb, so yeah. get some. Uh, there you go. So maybe get some ideas for uh, you know enhancing your landscape and uh, for pollinators and birds. Uh, try to keep those those other critters you don't want in the yard out. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, I had, a, I had a couple of thoughts on the trivia question today, and I, I thought, well, I'll go with this one. I think it's going to be a little easier one. I'll throw a second one out there if uh, this one seems to be too difficult. So we see a lot of black-capped chickadees at our bird feeders, mm-hmm. and uh, they're residents year-round here. Um, very friendly birds. They're very, you know, not very cautious at all with humans. Uh, and, uh, you know, small bird, but uh, very active. So how do they indicate alarm when they get alarmed from something. So hmm. how do black cap chickadees indicate alarm? Okay. And I'm looking for something specific as far as what they do. Okay. All right. There's your question. 382-4280, 877-382-4280. Those are the numbers to call. And again, I need to remind you that Gary and I are here all by our lonesome. So when the phone, when I answer the phone, I'm going to answer and then put you on hold like immediately so we can get you on the air as quickly as possible. I promise I am not hanging up on you. Yeah. So, so, so Jim so says we're alone. Jim's the only one that has a phone. So Yeah. I'm, I've got the phone here, but we don't have anybody in master control to answer the phones. So we've got to kind of do it in a unique way. Well, when I answer the phone, I'll, I'll pick it up, and then I'm going to put you on hold right away. So don't hang up. Just hang in there, and then we'll be right with you. So, uh, again, what's the question? So when black cap chickadees are alarmed, how do they indicate that? How do they communicate that to other black-capped chickadees? All right, that there's there's danger around. Yes. All right, 382-4280 and 877-382-4280. And, of course, uh, up for grabs is a $20 gift card from Woodell's. Yeah, so the black-capped chickadee are actually uh, quite numerous. You see those around the bird feeders quite often. They're usually considered cute just because of their, their small size. Uh, and they have a lot of uh, curiosity about everything, including humans. Um, they're frequently attracted to investigate birders making pishing sounds. Mm-hmm. So I make a little sound. Uh, and I noticed uh, when I was uh, refilling my feeder the other day, um, I had a couple of shrubs nearby that uh, birds can have, you know, go for some safe area if a hawk decides to wander in. And the, in, the one, in the one shrub, there was a chickadee there waiting for me to fill the feeder. <laughs> very, very anxiously waiting for me to fill the feeder. So they are around. Um, so black capped chickadees hide seeds and other food items to eat later. Um, each item is placed in a different spot, and the chickadee can remember thousands of hiding places. Wow. And so I, I, when I saw that fact, I always think about that with chickadees because I read that in the past. And you think of the term bird brain. Mm-hmm, yeah. And that came around originally, the term uh, uh, was in the early 1900s when that term bird brain came around, but it actually was, was a, a variation of the bird-witted term which has been around since at least the 1600s 
And it was a comment mainly because birds' brains are small. Um, I guess I would tax anyone to uh, have uh, something that they hide in thousands of uh, places and remember where each one is. I have a hard time doing it once. You know? <laughs> yes, I know. So, so I, I, I say if somebody calls you bird brain, I'm, you know, take, take it, it as, as a compliment. compliment. Yeah, and take it as a compliment. They probably um, don't. And know. it's interesting because you know, think, boy, they do that every year. It seemed like that one year would run into a, into the next. But every autumn, the chickadees actually allow their brain neurons containing old information to die. Wow! Replacing them with new neurons so they can adapt to changes in their social flocks. An environment, even with their tiny brain, so then they can remember where they put the new seed at, um, and the food. So pretty interesting. They sort of clean that palate, and you know that that. Uh, but that, you uh, wish we could do that. Yeah, it would be nice because of... sometimes we have that information we don't need anymore. Yeah, no kidding. It's just kind of <laughs> all right. So um, let's do the question once again, and then we'll take a real quick break. What's yeah. So the... how, how do black capped chickadees indicate alarm? Okay. And how do they communicate that? How do they uh, communicate that there's yeah, a, there's some, a some specific situation. sounds that they make? Okay. All right. 382 uh, Those are the numbers to call if you happen to know black-capped chickadees. When they, yes. What do they do to indicate alarm? That's, that's what you want. Yes. All right. So, all right. Well, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back and uh, we'll see if we can get a winner here in our uh, trivia contest on Nature Watch on this Saturday morning. Wild birds count on you for their meals this time of year. And Waddell's Nursery Florist and Garden Center is where you'll find the best selection of the bird feeding supplies you're looking for. To provide your feathered friends with the extra energy they need during colder weather, get nutty butter or berry essence suet cakes. Now on sale for $1.99 each or get a whole case of 12 for only $21.98. Plus, get a suet feeder for just a dollar when you buy any case of suet now through next Wednesday. Black oil sunflower seed makes a wide variety of wild birds happy. The large 50-pound bag is on sale for $28.99 or save even more and get two or more 50-pound bags for just $26 each. Want to hardnels? Get safflower seed. The 10-pound bag is now just $15.99 or get the big 50-pound bag for $62.99. You save $30. Waddell's Nursery Florist and Garden Center, the Kalamazoo area's bird feeding headquarters for 78 years. And WKZO News Time is 8.45, and we're back with Gary Miller on Nature Watch. And the question out there, of course, is... What, what, what do black-capped chickadees, how do they indicate alarm? What, what specific sounds do they make? And I want to give you a little hint there. Uh, so Jim and I were talking during break, and we haven't had any callers yet, so either nobody's awake this morning, uh-huh. <laughs> or we thought maybe they're safely driving and not trying to call and drive at the same time and going out to the fish hatchery. The fish hatchery for the uh, bird so, watch. Yeah, or the bird we'll, we'll see. Uh, maybe we'll get somebody to call in here soon. So the specific thing with the, the, the sounds that they make. So a little hint there. So... Um, there was actually a couple of answers, so a couple of correct answers. So okay. I'll take either one. All right. Well, in the meantime, let's drive on here. And uh, what? Um... So 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 chickadees actually, because we see a lot of them, and they are um, year-round residents here. Um, winter flocks of chickadees serve as a nucleus, and they contain mated pairs of chickadees and non-breeders, but generally not the offspring of the adult pairs within that flock. Other species that associate with chickadee flocks include nuthatches, woodpeckers, kinglets, creepers like the brown creeper, occasional warblers, if there's some warblers around, and vireos. And uh, so um, most birds that associate with chickadee flocks respond to chickadee alarm calls. So that's a, that call I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, even when their own species does not have a similar alarm call. And there is dominant hierarchy within flocks. Some birds are winter floaters that do not belong to a single flock. These individuals may have a different rank within each flock they spend time in. Even when temperatures are far below zero, chickadees virtually always sleep in their own individual cavities. In rotten wood, they can excavate nesting and roosting holes entirely on their own. Because small songbirds migrating through an unfamiliar area often associate with chickadee flocks, watching and listening for chickadee flocks during spring and fall can often alert birders to the presence of interesting migrants. So spring and fall migration period, look for those, you know, sound, listen for those chickadee flocks, look for them because you'll probably see some other migrants mixed in because, you know, chickadees are their local tour guides mm-hmm. and uh, so they might be able to see some unique birds. Um, so the chickadees are a little bit smaller than a sparrow and so they're like a small bird. 
Um, they've got that black cap and a bib that are black. Their cheeks are white. The back's often a soft gray. And the wing feather is gray edged with white. And the other parts of the bird are sort of a soft, buffy, tan color on the sides grading to white beneath. The cap extends down just beyond the black eyes, making the small eyes tricky to see. And uh, black-capped chickadees seldom remain at feeders except to grab a seed to eat elsewhere. They uh, are acrobatic, and uh, the sudden activity when a flock arrives is very distinctive. Uh, they often fly across open roads uh, roads and open areas one at a time with a bouncy flight. And there can usually be found any um, habitat that's got trees or woody shrubs. All right. Well, you know what? we got a caller. Ah. We have a caller. Good morning. Welcome to Nature Watch. Who's this? This is Ruth. Hi, Ruth. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. How Good. about you? Well, we're doing okay. All right. So you got the question. Uh, go ahead and see if we've got the right answer here. Yeah, it's a high-pitched call. They they sound the alarm. I will accept that because that is one of the more correct answers. So they make a high-pitched C sound, and uh, that's when it's a very high instant alert, basically, when there's a very fast-paced predator like a hawk all of a sudden in the area. Um, they'll also, if they have time to make an extended alarm, they'll add D syllables to their call. So their their call is typically a chick D D. And they'll keep adding D syllables on that the higher the alarm is. Oh, wow. And uh, so so the birds will catch that. So if you hear those chickadees calling out there and you start hearing them do a lot of those D sounds, you know there's probably something in the area that's threatening the birds around. Wow. That is pretty cool. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Ruth, yeah. con- congratulations. You uh, you have answered the question correctly, so you're going to get pick up the uh, $20 gift card. To Waddell's, I'm going to put you back on hold and hang on just for a couple of minutes, and we'll come around and get some information from you so sure. we can mail your prize to you, okay? Thank you. All right. Congratulations to Ruth. Yeah. yeah. Not, not too shabby. That's <laughs> that's pretty cool. So when you hear that, dee, 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 you know, it's just like, okay, look around. Yeah, there's probably a hawk in the area or so, or maybe a cat down the ground or something. So they'll, uh, yeah, they, they, they definitely sound that alarm. You know, as I, as I noted, two other birds hear that call, so... Uh, the birds listen to each other, even though they're not uh, the same uh, species. They do uh, help each other out at times. And uh, so chickadees, uh, a lot of times, will uh, nest in birch or alder trees. Yeah, but they're found, you know, all over in open fields, you know, next to wooded areas, open field areas. Um, in the winter, they eat about half seeds, berries, and other plant materi- material and half animal food, insects, spiders, suet and sometimes fat and bits of meat from frozen carcasses. In spring, summer, and fall, insects, spiders, and other animal food make up 80 to 90% of their diet. At feeders, they take mostly sunflower seeds, peanuts, suet, peanut butter, and mealworms. Uh, With the sunflower seeds, they peck a hole in the shell and then chip out and eat tiny bits of seed while expanding the hole. Their nests... Um, they actually um, use cavities, so small natural cavity or sometimes abandoned downy woodpecker cavities. They also excavate their own sometimes. And if you use a nest box, they actually prefer to excavate uh, wood shavings, uh, have have that nest in wood shavings or sawdust rather than just t- an empty box. And uh, they can be ground level up to uh, you know about 20 yards high, so about 60 feet or so. But usually between... Uh, you know, about five feet to, uh, oh, about uh, 20 feet or so. And uh, sometimes they, they will also excavate uh, holes in dead snags or rotten branches. So they, uh, flocks have uh, many calls. So we talked about those alarm calls. And they have specific meanings for them. And some of them may contain some of the characteristics of human language. So in most of North America, the song is simple, two or three note whistled Phoebe or Hey Sweetie. In the Pacific Northwest, the song is three to f- or four notes on the same pitch. The song is also different in Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. In much of the range, males begin singing in mid-January and the song increases in frequency as winter progresses. Females also sing occasionally. And as we noted that that uh, chickadee, the DDD uh, sound and the alarm, uh, and then they get that high-pitched C when they see a fast-approaching predator. When chickadees hear this call, they freeze in position until they hear a chickadee D call, signifying all clear. 
the uh, so they don't fly away. They don't fly away. They actually just sort of freeze oh. in some place that they're hopefully safe. And if they're not moving, sometimes that movement attracts predators. And so if they're not moving, they blend in with their, their land, oh, uh, okay. the background. All right. Well, that makes sense. Those those high sea alarm calls are most often given by males. And uh, chickadee nestlings sometimes make an explosive hiss and slap the inside of their nest cavity when an intruder looks in. So it uh, and they don't migrate, so they're year round. Um, they're basically coast to coast, um, from about uh, basically the northern half of the continental forty eight, and uh, up into uh, Canada, up into Alaska. They're up into uh, New- Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and uh, in Canada. So they're quite a big area that they cover, and uh, they're there year round. So my my other question that I had thought about was. With uh, last week, I talked about tufted titmouse, mm-hmm. T- tufted titmice or titmouses, depending on whichever <laughs> plural you want to use. But either one is correct. Uh, and uh, so, in that uh, tit, chickadee, and titmouse family, mm-hmm. there are three that are native to Michigan. So, tufted titmouse and the black capped chickadee are two of them. What was the third? And the third is the boreal chickadee. Okay. And I, you don't see them too often down here in the southern part of Michigan. Actually, their 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 breeding area and year-round location is part of the Upper Peninsula and north. Uh, okay, they're uh, a little bit different. So instead of a black cap, they have a brown cap, and they live in those coniferous forests, so like the spruce fir forests uh, in the far north year-round. And they also cache seeds like the black cap do for the winters. Um, that you don't see them very often this far south. So if you really want to see them and add them to that life list of birds that you see, you're probably going to have to go up into northern, you know, up into Canada, maybe into Alaska to try and see them. And they don't flock up like the black capped chickadees do. So they're very more solitary and they're not as populous either. So it may take a little bit of effort to find those and add those to your bird, hmm. your life list. Uh, they will visit, um, backyard feeders. Um, so if you're up in Northern Canada and, uh, you have that feeder out, you may see a boreal chickadee. Uh, and their tolerance of people has actually resulted in a couple of folk names, especially in Canada, where it's known as a tom tit, a chick chick, and a fillity. Okay. So, <laughs> some, some names for those. Um, it's interesting, chickadees and the their old world relatives, uh, the tits involved in, evolved in Eurasia. During glacial periods of the Pleistocene scene era, ancestors of modern-day chickadees are thought to have crossed a Bering Land bridge from present-day Russia into North America, very much like the first humans to arrive in the Americas. Okay. So the birds wow. came across that land bridge, too. Uh, hmm. And uh, they uh, actually found with some of the studies in the boreal chickadee that they, in their caches of food for winter, Mostly um, they cached insect larvae hmm. as well as some spruce seeds. So uh, they uh, store a little bit different food source. Uh, and, and they probably need that because it's colder farther north. Yeah, And we they imagine. need that energy from those insect larvae. Yeah, I was going to uh, say more. I wonder how long that stuff lasts. Well, it's cold. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, uh, you know they, they, they remember where all of them are. So I guess if uh, something's bad, they uh, go on to the they next one. They just go on to the next one, yeah. But uh, they uh, you know, specifically like those spruce and balsam fir uh, forests, often near water. Uh, when you get into western Canada, mixed and deciduous forests also host the species. And in Alaska, they use area, areas dominated by willow and alder in addition to spruce. And in the fall and winter, they typically are found mostly in areas dominated by the coniferous trees. Okay. And that's primarily so they have cover. So you don't have any you know, areas where they lose leaves and they don't have much cover. One, they get cover and they're safe from predators, but it also helps keep them warm. They can find that little well, area and, and some uh, needled evergreens. And uh, so they eat uh, mostly seeds and insects, including the eggs and larvae of insects. And while they... Um, which they get actually while they forage in the middle and higher parts of the forest canopy. Though sometimes they feed lower and even on the ground occasionally. They tend to use older trees. Uh, when feeding in spruces, they cling to cones to reach the seeds and hidden insects. 
They also pry open bark crevices with the bill in search of insects. Hmm. And uh, the uh, their, their nest is actually inside cavities, just like the black cap, um, usually in dead trees such as balsam fir, white spruce, black spruce, uh, white pine, tamarack, birch, aspen. So there are quite a few trees they use um, for nesting. Mm -hmm. Those entrances can be anywhere from 1 to 35 feet above the ground and usually has a side entrance. Although many have a top entrance hole, unusual among chickadees. Yeah. So if you have that tree that got snapped off from a storm or something, mm -hmm. and going uh, from the top, they have a you have an uh, entrance from the top. Okay. Uh, huh. So they they actually line their nests uh, uh, with dry moss, bark, hair, fur, feathers, lichen, and plant down, which is from ferns. And a little the interesting behavior of the, the boreal chickadee when courting. Males often chase females, sometimes in looping flights around a tree, spiraling downward and calling as they go. Sometimes uh, females solicit courtship feeding by quivering their ring wings. Males respond by feeding females as they would a begging nestling. So, and they uh, typically have multiple nest holes oh, that they're looking for. So okay. they, they check them all out before they decide on one and uh, build that nest. Oh, very cool. So I know, I know more about chickadees now than I ever have. This is cool. Yeah. So you might might see a boreal. I mean, occasionally they get down this this far this south. Far I know big. Peterson's guide shows them like you know very very limited. Yeah. Um, Audubon and uh, the Cornell Bird uh, Ornithology uh, Lab occasionally down this far south, but not very often. All right. So, you want to do it again next weekend? We'll do it again next week. All right. Let's do that, Gary. Have a wonderful uh, week. And yeah. We'll... So if you see anything in the you know this week. Uh, Something you want to email me about, uh, contact me at naturewatch at waddells.com. All right. And get outside and enjoy the outdoors. Cool. That's good advice. Thanks, Gary. We appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Nature Watch. Join us each Saturday after 830 for Nature Watch. Brought to you by Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center. Quarter of Milliman 12th. Attract